Thank you so much, Shay. Uh, very good day to you all and warm welcome to our webinar on the topic, Greater Than Some of Its Sports, Maritime Network in Pre-Modern Southeast Asia. It is from our Maritime Heritage series of webinar. It will be presented by Professor John N. Mexic, and it is our privilege and pleasure to have him with all of us. Uh, prior to moving to further details, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Vimal Kumar and a member of Technical Subcommittee of Joint Account Singapore. And our focus is to bring wealth of knowledge and insights to the easy and affordable reach of our members. Today, a webinar greater than some of its sports, Maritime Network in pre-modern Southeast Asia will describe the evidence for the development of port networks, the progress of archaeological research in adding to our understanding of how maritime trade networks operated in Asia in ancient medieval times and the probable shape of the network in the Temasek period. The talk is supported by our parent organizations, C9 IMRS, in various ways. And this event is also organized in association with our partner organizations from Singapore, and they are Society of Naval Architect, Society of Naval Architect and Marine Engineers, Singapore. Names and Singapore Shipping Association (SSA). And uh, before I invite the speaker, I'd like to provide some more info about who we are, what do we do, and where you can find more detail about us. So, and then we will come to the agenda of discussion, and then finally invite the speaker on the stage. So, coming to who we are and what do we do, and where you can find more detail about us, uh, we are Joint Brown Singapore works under the umbrella of our parent organization, Srina and IMRS. We strive to bring wealth of knowledge and insights to the easy and affordable reach of our members. In the last year, we have conducted numerous talks ranging from ship design to digitalization in the marine industry, tropical storms, green fuels, decarbonization to the maritime cybersecurity. Our talks were generally in person, we did few talks last in the physical setting as well. However, as the pandemic inflicted upon us and keep on clamping our life, we switched primarily to the online mode and continuing so far. There are a few measures from our annual dinner night, which we conduct annually to offer opportunity for our members to meet and interact with each other. We also celebrate and honor the member for their incredible contribution to the marine and offshore industry in form of lifetime achievement awards and various other kind of recognitions. Now, I'd like to give you more details about where you can find more detail about us. We are, we as a joint brand Singapore, uh, we are available on LinkedIn page and uh, we broadcast all our initiatives and upcoming events, talks, which we are doing right now, you can find those details on our page. If you are a member or a student member of Reno and I'm artist, uh, and you're best in Singapore, I would request to join the page. You can see the screenshot. If you want to join the page, what you can do, you can go to the LinkedIn and search Singapore Joint Branch and it will be directed to this page. You can also uh, know about our future events. Uh, you can visit imrs.org and visit the page dedicated to Singapore Joint Branch. All our technical events, which we are on, which are ongoing or upcoming, are updated over there as well. You can also find same details on uh, dina.org.uk, and uh, there is a page dedicated to Singapore Branch events. You can visit there. So there are three options: either LinkedIn page, imrs.org, and dina.org. Here you can find more details about our parent organizations, Lena and Amadist. If you want to visit, you can visit their respective site and you can find the details. Now coming to the agendas of uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, session is going to last for one and a half hour. In the first few, few minutes, which I'm doing right now, quickly introduce Singapore Joint Branch and our parent organizations, which I'm doing right now. And uh, talk is expected to last for 50 to 55 minutes, and then he will have opportunity to ask questions from the speaker. 
And the Q in the session is expected to continue for 20 to 25 minutes and uh, to ask the questions. What you can do, you can go to the slido.com and enter the code maritime. We expect to conclude our session by 7 p.m. Singapore time. The talk will be recorded as well and it will be available through MRS TV. So some kind of instruction since you are already joined the meeting. So only important part is the q and session, which is go to the slido.com and enter the event code many time, and then you can ask your questions. Uh, in the end, you will also have a opportunity to provide feedback about how we have done. Uh, in order to submit the details for the feedback, we will be sharing in the end of uh, session. Uh, the feedback is really important for us. It helps us to improve and bring relevant and thematic content in the future. During the survey, you will also have opportunity to convey what kind of subjects and themes you are interested in. We will try to align your interest with appropriate, appropriate speeches and talks. Now we will move to the technical webinar and uh, let me introduce the speaker. Having said, today's uh, 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 we have uh, Professor John in Mexico, and he received his uh, PhD from Cornell University Basin on archaeological fieldwork in, field in Sumatra. In 1987, he joined National University of Singapore, where he is Emirates uh, Professor in Southeast Asian Studies. He founded the archaeology unit at the Institute of Southeast uh, Asian Studies. He received an award from the government of Singapore and the court of Surakarta, Indonesia. His book, Singapore and the Silk Road of the Sea, won the inaugural award for the best book on the Singapore history in 2018. His specialities include historical archaeology of Southeast Asia, urbanizations, trade, Buddhism, and ceramics. So before I hand over the virtual stage, once again, I'd like to remind, if you have any questions, go to the slido.com and enter the code many times, and then you can pose questions that we will address in the end of the discussion. End of the discussion. And uh, here, now I would like to invite uh, Professor John on the virtual platform. Thank you very much, Bimal. And I'd like to thank uh, Marina Imrest for inviting me to give this talk today. <clears throat> um, uh, people con connected with maritime industry tend to be quite respectful of the traditions and heritage of the sea. And so um, I feel like I'm talking to a, a, a quite respectful and sympathetic audience today. So I'm really happy to have a chance to speak to you. I've been living in Singapore for the last 30 some years. And before that, I lived on three other islands in Southeast Asia. I was in Java for six years, Sumatra for three years, Penang, Malaysia for two years. So I've been pretty near to the sea for the last uh, 50 years or so of my life. Now, we now know a fair amount from archeology span and history about the early, some of the early important ports of Southeast Asia. A lot of work has been done in the last uh, 20, 25 years on this subject, but we still know very little about the connections between the ports. Of course, one port can exist without another set of ports to interact with. And we have so far very little information on how just how these ports were connected. What were the kind of regulations and practices that led to them becoming parts of networks? And that's what I'm trying to encourage research on now. Now, everybody knows about the, the Overland Silk Road that's uh, been very well known for a long period of time. Lots of historians and archeologists have gone across the mainland road. Uh, whereas on the other hand, travel across the maritime Silk Road has been very much less common. Um, it's a lot less common for people to actually uh, know that the maritime Silk Road is a lot more extensive, older, and uh, much more trafficked than the Overland Silk Road. So if we compare the two, you can see how much more complex the maritime uh, connections have been for the last 2000 years. So the mainland uh, 
capitals of Southeast Asia, the ancient cities in Cambodia, um, uh, Thailand, and so on are quite well known. They're characterized by large temples, whereas seaports leave hardly any traces. Um, the coastlines in the region have been changing uh, even for the last thousands of years. Uh, there's erosion, floods, waves. These all get together to obliterate most of the early port remains. Uh, most of the port construction was made out of wood also, which is perishable. So it doesn't leave us much to look at. So ports are a lot more difficult for archeologists to study. Another factor in Southeast Asia in particular is that a lot of Southeast Asians have actually lived on the water. They didn't even live on land for, we know as far back as history goes that many people lived full time either on boats or rafts or houses built over water. And so all the remains of their daily lives would never have gotten on land. They would be under the water. This is the mouth of the Singapore River about 100 years ago. And we know that when Raffles and the British arrived in 1819, a good population of Singapore at that time lived on the Singapore River, not on land. Uh, we know that this is typical of China. These are some boats up the Singapore River in the early 20th century. This is not strictly re limited to Southeast Asia. It's also a common practice in Southern China to live on houseboats. So this has been uh, one of the main factors which has made it difficult for us to get information about early poor life in Southeast Asia. Now, one can argue that um, the sea is in fact the core feature of Singapore's heritage. The lots of legends from uh, the early period about Pusu Island and uh, the various other people who were connected with the sea. But in modern life, a lot of fewer people are actually appreciative of or aware of even importance of the sea to Singapore life. So what I've been trying to do, and I've had, of course, a lot of collaboration with many other Singaporeans is to try to bring maritime heritage back into the forefront of what it means to be Singaporean, what Singaporean identity is. So these are examples of other types of these uh, lifestyles living on boats in other parts of the region. Some of these are in Sumatra, some are in the Malay Peninsula, uh, Thailand. Uh, these are modern villages over the rivers of Sumatra. This is just down in Tanjong Pinang. I'm sure many of you have been on to Tanjong Pinang and seen how many of the houses and shops and uh, even sidewalks are built over the river. This is in the uh, Ton Le Sap area of Cambodia. The, the, the river which leads from Angkor down to the Great Lake itself also you pass by many, many people living on boats full time. If you go to Eastern Indonesia, you'll see the Bugis, for example. You'll see this uh, same practice in Kalimantan. Most people have always lived near or on water in Southeast Asia, so it's a difficult subject to study. Peat swamps in Sumatra, some of these have been uh, excavated using modern techniques. And actually the preservation tends to be quite good. You find these very large house posts, for example, which can be over 2000 years old. The oldest piece of intact wood that I found in Southeast Asia was in a, a former um, shell mound in Sumatra, it's over 5,000 years old. So it's actually possible for wood to be quite well preserved, but it's a difficult kind of occupation. You have to pump out the water, there's the seasonal problems, you can only work at certain times of the year and so on. This is uh, one of the more major rivers in, in Malay and Singaporean history, which is actually located in Sumatra. It's the Musi River in uh, Palembang, and um, it's known as being the place where the Singapore ruler first appeared in the Malay Annals before he came to Singapore. And uh, there's been a lot of dredging of this river in recent times and has brought up huge quantities of artifacts. This has never been systematically pursued in Southeast Asia, this dredging of rivers to find uh, these kinds of ancient remains. But just uh, as a result of you know, the regular dredging for construction projects, clearing rivers of sandbars, or more recently active looting by local populations, um, the lots and lots of historical data on early ports is being lost all the time, just going straight into the antique dealers markets. Now, the same thing happened in Malacca about 15 years ago. And during the dredging there, of course, tons and tons of artifacts were discovered. Uh, Ming Dynasty Chinese ceramics, hundreds and hundreds of coins of different types, none of which were recorded. So all of that data, which could have come 
uh, to us from the Malacca River also was, was totally lost. The National University of Singapore has fairly strong connections to the maritime industry. Uh, it has various institutes connected with it. We have the Li Kong Chen Museum of Natural History. They exhibit some of the seashells I excavated from along the Singapore River, which date back 700 years. They show how Singapore's maritime and coastal ecology has changed in the last seven centuries. And before COVID hit, we were actually developing a program of sailing out of Singapore down to the Riau archipelago, where the students actually had to work the sails. And it was mainly oriented toward looking at the ecology of the area of uh, Riau. But we also did some look at some of the historical uh, sites within the Riau archipelago as well. Of course, this has now come to a complete standstill for the last year or so, but we hope to revive this project again soon as the COVID conditions permit. Uh, Singapore does not have a dedicated maritime museum. There was one for a while on Sentosa, the Maritime uh, Ex Experiential Museum. There was a whole display in that area about 14th century Singapore, the Tomasic Gallery. And uh, there was, of course, the, and still is, the reconstructed version of the 9th century Arab Dao called the Jewel of Muscat. But now this museum, as such, does not exist anymore. It's been abolished and turned back into part of the aquarium. So we still have no dedicated maritime museum in Singapore, unfortunately. These are some of the books that I've published trying to get people interested in the subject besides the one on Singapore's 500 years before colonialism. There's a book between two oceans, which is more of a military history of Singapore together with my colleagues at uh, NUS. Uh, the book on ancient harbors in Southeast Asia. So that's looking at various other ports in Southeast Asia and the early kinds of research that's been done on them as well. And I have done some underwater work, mainly in Indonesia. Uh, this is the one I was working with a student of mine, uh, Michael Flecker here, who did his PhD on underwater archeology. span And this is uh, working on a, a 13th century shipwreck in the West Java Sea. This was our barge, the crew quarters, and the kind of artifacts that we discovered there. So shipwrecks also are completely uh, quite useful in trying to reconstruct ancient patterns. One thing you can do is to look at the stowage of the cargo. And this will give you actually an idea of whether the, point, the ship was going from one point to another or whether it was going to multiple different destinations and whether the cargo was owned by maybe a single individual or a group or whether or not there are lots of small traders on board, each with their own individual consignments for sale. So we have, when we can get real archeological data, we can get down to the nitty gritty details of some of these aspects of early Southeast Asian maritime exchange. But uh, again, during the last year or so, there's been, of course, a complete hold on this kind of research too. Now, my first research has, uh, as a beginning undergraduate student also had to do with maritime archeology, span but it was in a, the other end of the world. It was up in Northern Canada on Hudson's Bay, looking at early maritime adaptations of the Inuit. And uh, so I didn't set out to become a Southeast Asian maritime archeologist, but uh, by uh, a number of different coincidental circumstances, what I, uh, I ended up doing for the last 50 years. Now, one of my professors at Cornell Oliver Walters was a member of the old Malayan civil service back in the colonial era. And he wrote this book on history, culture, and region in Southeast Asian perspectives. And he was comparing the South China Sea to the Mediterranean as a geographical factor, which has had great influence over historical development of people living on the land, whether it's the mainland or the islands. It's obvious that Singapore owes its existence to the connection with that sea the South China Sea, but also the Java Sea and the Indian Ocean. And actually, if you look at the South China Sea, it's 40% bigger than the Mediterranean. Uh, the, the Mediterranean is basically landlocked. It only has one tiny outlet uh, through the Straits of Gibraltar, whereas the South China Sea has multiple outlets. Straits of Malacca, uh, the Sunda Strait, the Straits of the Gaspar Strait, which leads down to the Java Sea, also the Straits leading uh, between the South China Sea and the Southern Philippines into Eastern Indonesia, which is very important thousands of years ago. So the um, networks within the South China Sea, and if you add in the Indian Ocean are much more complex than those of the Mediterranean. It's a lot more interesting to study. 
So one thing that I have done along with my colleague, uh, a Singaporean archaeologist, uh, Gogo Ken, is looking at how we can divide up Southeast Asia into spheres of economic exchange. And here you can see the different uh, um, spheres outlined by the dotted lines here. These indicate different types of networks which exist just for the transshipment of one kind of commodity, that is ancient pottery. Ancient ceramics, whether it's Chinese or Indian or Southeast Asian made, has been one of the major commodities shipped for hundreds of years. And they, unlike many other kinds of commodities, actually can survive perfectly under the sea for thousands of years. And so this is looking at just the various spheres of interlocking kinds of trade in different types of commodities of ceramics over the last 2000 years. And this is in this handbook of archeology span and globalization, archeologists are quite interested in the study of pre-modern globalization. Now, the major seafarers of Southeast Asia were the Malayo-Polynesians who from a an original starting point in South uh, Philippines, Northeast Borneo, they spread out in various directions out to the east into Polynesia, which is why we call them the Malayo Polynesians, the Hawaiians, the New Zealanders are related to the Malays, but so are also the people of Madagascar all the way over on the west side of the Indian Ocean. So the Malayo Polynesians were the greatest seafarers of the ancient world in prehistoric times. And we can still see lots of uh, studies of how this network set up by the Malayo Polynesians uh, operated in the late 19th century when Europeans began to study it. Um, we can see these uh, piles of pottery made in Eastern Indonesia, for example, for transport to other islands where pottery was not made uh, in exchange for sea products. So there's a lot of good ethnographic information about how these tra traditional networks used to operate and why people were so interested in doing it. Why were the Malays so involved in maritime commerce? A lot of it had to do with their interest in uh, getting higher status. Well, it's one way they could become higher status is by becoming prosperous through maritime trade. We have lots of early studies of Malay maritime technology, shipbuilding, things like the outriggers, things like their navigational systems, how they navigated by using star charts and so on. So there's lots of good ethnographic historical data about the Malayal Polynesians. There's also lots of information about the commodities, especially the spices, which were already being traded both across the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean over 2000 years ago, things from Eastern Indonesia. And so way out in Eastern Indonesia, this is of course, one of the major sources of one of the commodities that made the Europeans interested in coming to Southeast Asia 500 years ago. And so that's why we have, for example, the. Uh, the statement, which I love the statement made by the early Portuguese, Tomé Pires, shows how interconnected Southeast Asia was. Whoever controls Malacca has his hand on the throat of Venice, which is what the Portuguese actually circumvented the whole south end of Africa in order to be able to do, to control the spice trade, and therefore cut out the Venetians who got all their wealth from the spice trade. Here we have all these forts built during the colonial period out in eastern Indonesia. The Rune Island, for example, that's this tiny little island out in the Moluccas. You can see it, it's on the right of this slide. It was traded by the, between the British and the Dutch for Manhattan. So New York City actually was obtained in exchange for this island between the Dutch and the British. So looking at the uh, South China Sea, Indian Ocean, the area right around Singapore is actually the, where the transition is made. You can get across the Indian Ocean in one season, you get across the South China Sea in one monsoon, but you can't cross both of these in one season or very difficult to do in ancient times. So South, the Southern Ocean is what the Chinese called it, the interlocking connections between the South China Sea and Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. These are all interconnected by 2000 years ago. So much of the Southern Ocean, as they called it, was dependent on the wind for its uh, sea, for its uh, development. So you could go, these are the two seas, and then the third one, which is important also, it was a triangle. India, China, and Eastern Indonesia all were integral into one major system of port networks, which already evolved more than 2000 years ago. We see first evidence of this through this uh, trade in these very large bronze drums. They, on the map at the lower left, you can see all the locations where these bronze drums have been discovered. 
These are over 2,000 years old. They were made up in North Vietnam. So they're called Dong Son after the place where they were made, but they were tra traded all the way down the Straits of Malacca, through Indonesia, across to the Spice Islands and even New Guinea. And on them we see scenes like um, warriors on boats and so on. So there was already a maritime network among various ports in Southeast Asia by 2,000 years ago. But we know well, we have only maybe two sites from this entire period so far. So it's impossible for us to really decipher the port network. We have only a couple locations so far been discovered. One is in South Thailand, a site named Koh Sam Kao. And already here we have evidence for both Chinese and Indian artifacts being brought into the site 2,000 years ago. And the people there even had connections all the way to the Mediterranean. Now that we have some of these uh, Roman intaglios, for example, this is Mars, the god of war. We have Indian inscriptions using old Brahmi script. And uh, so the port was on the east coast of the Malay Peninsula in this area of southern Thailand. But we know that there were portage routes going across. Apparently 2,000 years ago was still faster to portage things overland than it was to go all the way south to the Straits of Malacca and then go north again because you had to wait around for the proper wind direction to change. So over 2,000 years ago, they were still portaging across the peninsula. But around 2,000 years ago already, they overcame this problem. It was around this time that uh, the Mediterranean even became involved with Southeast Asia. This is a medieval map, but it's based on ancient Greek sources, which were preserved in Arabic um, texts. And it basically shows the Indian Ocean. Here is the Mediterranean, and here is the Malay Peninsula. So the, the, the Greco-Romans were aware of the Malay Peninsula 2,000 years ago. There was a port down here. On, uh, the Red Sea coast of, Af of India, of Africa, named Berenike, from which the Romans actually derived a huge amount of tax, enough to support several Roman legions from taxing the trade with India. And so you can see they, know, they knew something about England, the British Isles. They didn't even know, they didn't even know that um, England, Scotland, Wales was a separate island from Ireland. They knew much more about the Malay Peninsula than they did about the UK at this time. And this is the section about the Malay Peninsula, and it mentions a seaport in the Singapore area. This is 2,000 years ago. Um, it was called Sabana on this map. And there's another one here called Takola on the Upper Peninsula, and maybe one of the recent sites that's been discovered. So it mentions another city or polis in the Kelantan area around here, four other towns, one portage route, there's another guidebook, which was in ancient Greek also called Periplus Mara Erythriensis, which means sailor's guide to the Indian Ocean. So around 2000 years ago, the Mediterranean peoples became aware of the Indian Ocean maritime route. And they, they imported the silk, they imported spices from the Eastern Archipelago in China. And that lasted for about two or three centuries. And then it all fell apart. The Mediterranean, of course, went into the Dark Ages Whereas the South Ocean, the maritime network between India, China, Southeast Asia maintained its uh, prosperity. The Europeans are not very important to it at this time. We can use some Chinese text to piece together the locations of some of these ports, but it's only very conjectural. In many of these places, there's either been no archeological research or we haven't really discovered ports of the, this era. Going back to the third century, we have some Chinese descriptions of Western Indonesia, in the fifth century, again, we have a bit more information, but Chinese were not sailing yet at this period. They didn't have long distance maritime technology. They were sailing on ships mainly belonging to Southeast Asians. Uh, Fa Xian is one of the well-known Chinese who sailed back to Southeast Asia, to China from India. He'd gone to India to study Buddhism and he returned via the sea. And these are some of the sites in West Java from which date from this period, indicate quite a bit of uh, familiarity with India. Here we have, for example, um, this is a bowl imported from South India, probably made in the Chennai area, and it was already uh, imported to Java around the third or fourth century. Gold, some Chinese wares as well. By the seventh century, we have more information based on another Chinese Buddhist pilgrims reports. By this time, most Chinese Buddhists were going to India by sea, not by land. 
they found it was much more convenient and uh, comfortable to travel to India by sea than going the overland Silk Road. So by the seventh century already, the maritime route was beginning to take over from the overland route. Um, he mentioned 60 Chinese, two thirds of whom went to India by sea in the seventh century. And there are several different routes that we can piece together. Um, some going uh, down to Sumatra, some going to Java, and then they both either went up to Bengal or they went down to South India, also in the, uh, the Chennai area. So we have a lot of information from this period, but so far a little, uh, little archaeological evidence. This is a kind of our drawing of Yi Qing. This is the place he came from up in Xi'an. This is the monastery he worked in. This is the monastery in Bengal he went to study at for 18 years. Um, the oldest, uh, well, then the second oldest, shall we say, there's an older ship in uh, Kalimantan, no, sorry, Kalantan, or sorry, Pahang, which is uh, a Malay ship. But by the, the ninth century, we have depictions of Southeast Asian ships on Borobudur, for example, in Java. This is a ninth century Javanese ship, has outriggers, has these typical tripod masts, two masts. It has a, also a stern uh, side rudders. We don't have any indicate any real drawings of detailed depictions of Indian or Arab or Persian ships until the 12th century. But um, there's a lot of information about the sailing networks in the thousand and nights and a night. The Arabian Nights, as it's often called in English, so Alf Leila wa Leila. And uh, Sinbad the Sailor, of course, is one of the heroes of the Thousand and One Nights. And three of his seven voyages, he always got shipwrecked, but uh, three of his seven voyages he made were actually to Southeast Asia. Uh, one of them was to Al Salahita, where they got sandalwood. Salat is, of course, a strait in Malay. Sandalwood is an Indonesian tree. And voyage number two, he saw fish like a cow in these Indian seas. Uh, there was a dugong. Of course, there are lots of places called Sungai Dugong in the Straits of Malacca, Dugong River. Voyage three, he went to the island of Kala, which is probably Kida, hard by the land of Hind, which is India. Has a powerful king, produces camphor, abundance of Indian rotan, a lead mine. But again, these are products of the Straits of Malacca, Malay Peninsula, Sumatra. Then from uh, Arabic or Arab or Persian texts, we can piece together a very detailed picture of their maritime connections from all around the, the Hadramaut coast, coast of the uh, Arabian Peninsula, down the east coast of Africa, across to Gujarat and the southwest coast of Kerala. And then some, uh, that was a majority of the routes, the short ones here, but they do have, they have some routes going around Sri Lanka because they couldn't go through this uh, little narrow strait here between Sri Lanka and India, then up either to Bengal or the Arakan coast of Myanmar, and a couple straight across the sea to the north tip of Sumatra and over to the Malay Peninsula. And then we have one route going down to Java. We have no routes in these Arab sailing directions about the South China Sea. So there isn't any indication that they knew this route yet. But we have found one of the oldest shipwrecks in South Asia, Southeast Asia, down, sorry, uh, down here, the Belitung shipwreck. And it is an Arab Dao. This is in the, uh, irrefutable. And it was found down here, kind of the, the, the border between the South China Sea and the Java Sea. And it dates from the ninth century, which is exactly the period when Sinbad the sailor's stories take place. So obviously Sinbad stories were not totally fabricated. They were based on real life experiences of Arab Persian sailors coming to Southeast Asia. But there's still a lot of undecided, sorry, a lot of uh, unanswered questions like just where was the ship going? Um, where had it come from? Who was on board? And so there's still lots of things we haven't been able to answer yet. And of course, we have this fabulous collection, which now is the property of the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore, these very large ceramics, gold, and much else besides, which is still being studied now. Now, we, it's not only too much later till the Portuguese that we begin to get some indication of the networks across the South China Sea. So these are based on early Portuguese records of Southeast Asian voyages across from the Singapore area. Sometimes going to Tioman, then going straight across. There was a normal route across 
to the land off the south the tip of Vietnam, and then mostly hugging the coast to get around all of these reefs and things. They didn't sail straight across the South China Sea. That was kind of no man's land because it's very difficult to navigate through here. So they mostly went around the islands or down the east side of the South China Sea. No routes down there. Uh, it seems likely that there were port networks in early Southeast Asia, possibly even maritime based states. There's this idea in early European medieval history about the medieval sea state, which connected, for example, um, England and the uh, east coast of uh, Britain to the area of Scandinavia. Of course, the best known of these is Venice itself, which is an archipelago of various ports along the east part side of the Mediterranean. It seems quite likely that there is such a network within Southeast Asia as well. Now, one of the main routes was straight across uh, the south side of the Bay of Bengal, straight to Southern India. And uh, this is where I first lived in Southeast Asia, 1968, 1972. Uh, so part of the time I lived here at the foot of this mountain, Kedah Peak, and uh, part of the time in, on the island of Penang. And this area here was actually one of the earliest important ports in Southeast Asia, the very entrance to the, the northern end to the Straits of Malacca. So that's when I first got interested in Southeast Asian maritime history. There are a lot of discoveries of boats there, but none of these have yet been carbon dated. So we have lots of evidence of the maritime activities in Kedah. Um, archaeological evidence so far is mainly from ceramics and inscriptions and coins. The, the first great Southeast Asian maritime kingdom was known as Sri Vijaya. It was probably based at Palembang, but it may have been a confederation of ports like the Hanseatic League of Europe. And so these are the various ports mentioned in uh, an inscription found in South India in uh, Tanjore, which was the capital of the Chola kingdom in the 11th century, when all these ports were conquered by the Chola kingdom. And the, the, tends, the, the Chola sources, the Indian sources, tend to depict all these as semi-independent ports, which belong to Sri Vijaya, but they had their own connections, they had their own kind of economic autonomy. I first did um, my own research at a small port, which dates from uh, seven to 800 years ago in Northeast Sumatra, a place called Chinese Fort or Kota China in Malay. And this is the kind of port that I think there may are probably a lot more examples of. Uh, they're in the mangrove swamps and places like this, um, coconut plantations. So they don't have any kind of standing ruins on top of them. But you have to explore the rivers along the, the coast of the Straits of Malacca to find them. And I suspect that once there is some more concentrated research of this type, uh, there will be a lot more of these early ports discovered. Now, this is my old professor, Oliver Walters, up here who wrote a book about the fall of Sri Vijaya in Malay history. And he said that, uh, of course, there's a lot of information about Singapore in the Malay Annals. The Malay Annals call Singapore the first great Malay trading port. But at when the time Raffles was, uh, Raffles was uh, also looking for a port, he believed the Malay Annals was literally true. And so that's why he came to Singapore, 1819, because he believed that Singapore had been an ancient port. But Walter said that whole story was fiction. It was a fabrication made up. And so there is this uh, kind of a controversy about whether the Malay Annals was a reliable source for Singapore history or not. And that was, uh, so many, most people were still taught this in Singapore schools until recently, that Singapore was nothing until Raffles arrived. This is how Singapore would have looked in 1819. A few people living along the shore, people living on boats in the Singapore River, but it was never anything more than kind of a pirate layer in a fishing village. But the Malayan Elves um, says that it was composed in 1612, says that Alexander the Great, we know this is true, conquered India, converted India to Islam, we know that's not true, and he married a king's daughter, had a son named Raja Shulan, who succeeded him. This Malayan Elves was actually written up the Johor River. At this time, the capital was up here in Johor. And it paints Singapore, as being the first great Malay trading port. It says that Raja Shulang was a great conqueror, was succeeded by Raja Chulang. These are both obviously names for Rajendra Chola, who was the ruler of the Chola Empire of Chennai, uh, who conquered Sri Vijaya. So the, the, the Tanjore 
inscription and the Malayan Hells do coincide in talking about Raja Shula and Rajendra Chola. He wanted to conquer India, but only got as far as Tomasic, which was Singapore. He descended into the sea in a glass case, married the princess, this is under the Singapore Strait, and had three sons. And eventually he got homesick, went back to India. So this is, uh, if he was from Negapatanam, here, according to the, uh, the, the, the uh, Malianels. And so then these three sons appear magically on the hill in Palembang, where Sri Vijaya was probably located. The third of them was named Sa Sang Nila Utama. He stayed in Palembang, became the king, who was given the title, a Sanskrit title, Sri Tri Buana, Lord of the Three Worlds. But, um, and uh, so there's a legend down in Bintan that this is the tombstone of one of these two widows who first discovered the three young men on top of the hill in, in Palembang. And there's an early Islamic tombstone, so it's not from the seventh century, but it's probably from the 14th, 15th century down on Bintan. Bintan was an important site. And so one day he was exploring Bintan. He met the queen who then uh, let him explore her territory. He went up on a high rock and he saw this place across the water called Tomasi. So this is what it says. Looking across the water, he saw the land on the other side had sandy beach, so white it looked like a sheet of cloth. So he asked, what's that nice sandy beach over there? And uh, his uh, companion said, that, your highness, is Tomasic. And so he was attracted to go and visit this beach on the south shore of Singapore. And so quite by chance, two, uh, 20 years ago, we were excavating near the cricket club. Under the padang, we discovered the white sandy beach. This is totally accidental. And so here's the padang. Here's the British period. They deposited clay on there to make it nice and flat for tennis and cricket. Here is the underlying soil. Here is a black sandy layer, which is all 14th century, stained black by human activity, very dense like occupation of the Padang 700 years ago. And under that is a pure white sandy beach before humans came here. So it coincides directly with the Malayan Isles. It was a white sandy beach on the coast. And then, of course, he wanders around and he sees this strange beast and no one knows what kind of animal it is. So one of his men says, I, I heard it said that there's a lion, that lions look like that. So we decided to call it a lion. So that's how Singapore got its name, changed from Tomasic to Sanskrit, Lion City. Um, now, that this, Singapore was a very, um, it was very located in a very strategic look, uh, place. It was right at the borderland in the 14th century between two empires. Ayutthaya up on the mainland, it was the most, most powerful, had already conquered Cambodia. And down in the south, you had Majapahit on the island of Java. And there are two spheres of influence, the mainland and the islands overlapped in the Singapore area. It's quite likely that actually Singapore paid tribute to both Ayutthaya and Majapahit. So this is, um, so this, this is a so site, you know, this is the site of the capital of Ayutthaya probably Singapore had to pay tribute to them. The Chinese say that uh, Ayutthaya, or Sian, which is Siam, attacked Tomasic at one time, probably because he didn't pay tribute. And this is a, uh, this is a Javanese manuscript from Majapahit, 14th century, which says that uh, Tomasic was one of the territories of Majapahit. So both sides, the mainland and the islands, were trying to claim control over Singapore. Um, Trulan is the capital of Majapahit. We find many, many Chinese coins there. And we even find piggy banks. So they actually stored their wealth in piggy banks. So Chinese coinage was the basic monetary medium of exchange in places like Java, Sumatra, and Singapore at this period. There's a legend about, one of the legends about Singapore in the Malayan Isles is the story of Badang, a slave, became incredibly strong. He was made the war chief by the ruler. And then one of the things that he did in the conquest of the great strong man of, of India was to throw a rock from Fort Canning down to the mouth of the Singapore River. And that's this is him doing this. This is from cartoons by the Malaysian cartoonist Locke. And then this is probably the same rock that is said in the Malayan Isles to be the place where after he came back from visiting Undersea Kingdom, Raja Shulan had a stone carved Hindustani characters, it says, to record his exploits under the Singapore Strait. 
When Raffles arrived, there was a giant stone here with writing on it, which later on the British blew up to build Fort Fullerton. But this fragment is still in the Singapore National Museum. But no one can read it, unfortunately. But it shows there was a kind of a big inscription at the river mouth. These are the three fragments of it. This is the location where it used to be, where the Merlion was. So later on, independent Singapore used the same location to build its own monument, the Merlion. Uh, we'll never know what it said. I have a theory that uh, this is, it said something like this, but we'll never know for sure. So when the British arrived, Raffles found a lot of evidence that supported his theory that Singapore was an ancient port. There is a line here called the Old Lines of Singapore. That was an earthen rampart. It was about 2.7 meters high. Ran along what is now Stamford Road. Stamford Road was built on top of the old Malay Wall. And there was the inscription at the mouth of the river, and there were lots of ruins on Fort Canning Hill. So the old lines, freshwater stream. So Raffles arrived, and he believed that he was reestablishing a, a port on an ancient site. So that's why he chose Singapore. Now there, over time, some accidental discoveries were made on Fort Canning, like these gold pieces of jewelry, 1928. And in our excavations, we've discovered more gold at various sites. There was a lot of gold in Singapore of the 14th century. Now, how do we know this is 14th century? Well, this is a statue of a king of Sumatra from the 14th century. This is in the Jakarta National Museum. It was found in West Sumatra, and he's wearing an identical ornament to the one found on Fort Canning. So it's quite likely that this thing on Fort Canning was also a piece of royal jewelry. We have other unique items indicating in the, uh, connections with China in the 14th century. This is the only known ancient porcelain compass. There is none in China that's been discovered. This is a Chinese porcelain compass, which may be the only one they ever made, and it got sent to Singapore. This is what the Chinese brands, bronze compasses usually look like. And that's a, so the navigational compasses they used were this kind of bronze material. So, and we also found lots of these little porcelain figurines, such as this, lots and lots of little fragments. This actually seems to be a Westerner wearing a turban of some type. And these are fragments of a pillow in the form of a Chinese theater stage. So there were, in other words, there was a very unusual elite living on Fort Canning Hill in the 14th century when the Moyanels says that there was. So it seems like my old professor's theory that this was made up is not correct. I falsified my old teacher's idea. Now the Chinese begin to mention Tomasic or Singapore area already in 1320, when they sent envoys to Long Yaman, the Dragon's Tooth Strait, asking for tame elephants. So Bintan then sent a mission to China, 1323, 1325, Long Yaman sent a mission. Long Yaman, Dragon's Tooth Strait, there was no doubt that the the, the straits here, the western end of Capo Harbor. Later on, it became known, or it was known in Malay as Batu Berlayar. And this is, of course, what it looked like in the 19th century. It looked like a sail. So the Malays called it Sail Rock. The Chinese called it the Dragon's Tooth Strait. And so these are the three places the Chinese seem to have known in the 14th century the Dragon's Tooth Strait, Tan Mashi, Tomasic in general, the whole island, and then another place called Panchur. So this is the first British map of that same area. And this dates from 109 years before Raffles, 110 years. This shows the Dragon's Two still standing in the narrow straits of Singapore. So the British were already exploring the strait 110 years before Raffles came. Whether Raffles knew this map existed, I don't know, because he never mentioned it, but it is in the British Library. That's what, of course, looked like in the um, late uh, 20th century. And so they actually sailed through there. So the, the Singapore is mentioned in a 14th century Chinese trader's guide to Southeast Asia. It says the inhabitants live at a place called Bansu, which is probably Panchur in Malay, spring of water. It says the inhabitants there are honest. The people at Long Yaman were pirates, but the people living around the Singapore River were honest. Um, they, made, they, they had several kinds of occupations. They boiled seawater to make salt. They made rice wine, they have a chief, trading goods were satin, and so on. And so we actually 
uh, tried to do a kind of a theoretical reconstruction of the Malay Palace on Fort Cannon. And we had a whole website devoted to it set up by um, the uh, Heritage, uh, National Heritage Board called ruleoftomasek.com. It doesn't exist any longer. It was only up for 10, seven years between 2010 and 2017. So you can't visit ancient Tomasek anymore, I'm afraid, unless we revive this someday. Uh, this is just uh, we, we reconstructed ancient ships and so on, what they would have looked like. So we began doing archaeological research in Singapore in 1984. Uh, Fort Canning Hill, where there's still an outdoor display of the ruins we, uh, and other artifacts we discovered there right near the registries of marriage. Then later on, we, we excavated sites along the Singapore River Parliament House complex before they built a modern Parliament House Empress Place when the uh, Empress Place building was being converted into the Asian Civilization Museum. These are excavations there all done by Singapore volunteers. Artifacts, we find lots and lots of things connected with metalworking, such as making fish hooks, indication of the importance of fishing in early Singapore spears and other weapons like this, evidence of bronze working. So there was a lot of bronze working going on along the Singapore River. And they were using both Chinese and Sri Lankan coins. We haven't found any Indian coins, but we have found Sri Lankan coins, um, such as this one here, which is from uh, Sahasamala, 13th century. And we found this statue. We have no idea what it represents. It's made out of lead. It's the only known statue made out of lead from ancient Southeast Asia. And it's in a kind of Javanese st style that shows a man riding a horse. We have so far no idea what this symbolizes. That's a unique, in other words, the unique artifacts. So Singapore in the 14th century had quite a unique culture. It had its own artistic style even. Tortoise shell we found also. This would be one of the main things that was probably of interest to the Chinese because they were probably making things like combs. This is an ancient Chinese comb made from tortoise shell. And that the areas of tortoise shells, this is where they mainly came from, the Riau area and the east side of the South China Sea. This is actually an imperial monopoly in China in ancient times. So it's not surprising that we actually have lots of evidence of trade between Singapore and the Riau Linga archipelago. Now this, these are the seven islands out here, eastern part of Indonesia. Back in the early 1990s, antique dealers in Singapore were flooded with um, our Chinese artifacts, mainly porcelain, but some gold also, dating from the 14th century. They, they said they were bringing them in from the Rio Linga archipelago. And so I visited some of the islands out there and found out that they were looting old grapes. And so these are some of the things that they kept because they accidentally broke them when they were looting them. So they were digging graves in the 14th century and burying lots and lots of Chinese porcelain. No doubt this indicates a kind of a hierarchical system of marketing where Singapore was the main connection point to the east-west trading system. But then Singapore was a central node for the people living out in the South China Sea, um, Rio Archipelago. Now, Singapore continued to exist after Malacca became the overlord of the Straits of Malacca in 1400. So the, the Sultan of Malacca actually told the King of Ryukyu in 1468, all the lands within the seas are united in one body. In other words, there's a great commercial network. This is 40 years before the Portuguese arrived. Life has never been so good in preceding generations as it is today. So Malacca was extremely prosperous. It was one of the most prosperous ports in the world. The Portuguese knew about it, obviously. And of course, one of the most famous heroes of Malacca is named Hung Tua. And I have this theory that Hung Tua was actually a Singaporean. Now with the founding of Malacca, Singapore became, is no longer an independent kingdom. It becomes a domain of the Malacca Laksamana, the Sri Bijati Raja. So Singapore was not abandoned. In fact, it was a naval base for Malacca. Hung Tua was the Laksamana and he lived in Singapore, according to the Malayan Isles. So why would he live in Singapore? Well, the Malayan analysis says that Singapore had the most ships of any of Malacca's territories, 40 three-masted ships. So Singapore was the main source of naval strength in Malacca. Malacca had no seafaring population. So when the Portuguese arrived, they actually considered also occupying Singapore and they did attack Singapore 
they claim to have wiped out Singapore at least once. Um, so the, the Portuguese uh, actually didn't make a map of Singapore. This is the map on the, the right. They didn't have the north at the top. <laughs> they had, uh, it was all mixed up. But you can see that there are Ujong Tana, that's the land Zen, that's Johor. There's a place called Blakang Mati, which of course used to be Sentosa. You have uh, Ta, uh, Sungai Baru, Sungai Bedok. You have Tanamera. So these names, which are still in Singapore today, already existed in Singapore when the Portuguese began to map it. And they mentioned there was a Shah Bandar, which is a harbor master. So in 1600, there was still um, um, an official in charge of trade in Singapore. But Singapore then got wiped out and abandoned shortly after this map was made. So that's where uh, the Portuguese were attacking the main center up the Singapore River here. Now, one of the places I lived for two years was Ben Kulin. And of course, Ben Kulin is commemorating Singapore and Ben Kulin Street. But this is where Raffles was living when he decided to go and find a better seaport. And so he, this is Fort Marlborough, and this is where the British had their main base. And Raffles thought it was a terrible location because it was completely off the main sailing routes. This is what it looked like when I lived there. It was just a really um, undeveloped province. People still get, went around in caravans of ox carts. They crossed rivers on rafts, sailed around in sailboats and so on. And so I did some excavations at the site of the old British fort there. That's quite interesting. You can see now the importance of the connections. When Kulin was set up, in the main pepper trading area. But it was not a pepper trading port, it was a pepper growing region. And so the British lost tons of money here. And so when they got a, a permission to set up a base in Singapore instead, of course, they gave up in Kulin and the Dutch then took it over. So it shows how important linkages are to other ports. It's not just the location of the resources, but it's the networks of ports that actually has to be understood to understand just why on certain networks and certain systems of port development occurred at various times. And this is what I've been trying to get Southeast Asian archaeologists to do, is to move on to the next stage and look at the ports, the connections between various parts of Southeast Asia, not just individual countries. Look at the data we're getting from early port sites and see how Southeast Asia was already a maritime trading network and how what was also established its connections with ports in the Indian Ocean, South China Sea. So this has been now in my latter part of my career is my mission to try and get this kind of uh, activity begun. So I will stop at this point and I will turn the uh, floor back over to Vimal. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for digging deeper into root and uh, making us more aware about you know, route and that that's helps us to you know understand the, the the time from there to now. So now we will move to the Q and A session, uh, and uh, I will start with the first questions. Uh, that is uh, uh, definitely the technical research, technical uh, the arch extensive archaeological research uh, has helped us to know our past better. But do you think best is yet to come? And uh, associated one is in what are area research and archaeological excavation you see needed and necessary in the future? There are several parts of Singapore I haven't really been able to explore. One is the whole northwest coast of Singapore. This is the area around um, facing the, the, north, the northwest side from Kranji down to Tuas. That area is mainly military. Singapore Armed Forces training grounds and uh, public works um, water uh, reservoirs and so on. So that area is off limits. But we know there's at least one important prehistoric archaeological site in that area. Um, the northeast coast also is another area which I've only done a little bit of research on. Um, I have found sites going back possibly to the 14th century on the northeast side, but there's been so much redevelopment there. And I suspect maybe Pulau Takong might actually have been important because it's a uh, it also controls access to the Johor estuary. So the northeast side, Pongol, and the offshore islands, Ubi and Takong, I think, are also um, quite um, high potential. But the most important is underwater archaeology. I'm sure there are many shipwrecks in and around Singapore. 
And that's one of the most important things I would think of to set up is maybe some kind of collaboration with Malaysia and Indonesia uh, to explore the, the kind of boundary areas, both under the Singapore Strait and looking at the Johor Strait as well. We know that there were big naval battles fought between the Dutch and the Portuguese off of Changi Point. That there were many ships were sunk in those battles. They, some of them obviously are now under Changi Airport when they reclaim that land. But I'm sure there are other areas just off of say Changi in that area, which might still have underwater ships um, around Pedro Branca and so on. So though there's still lots of areas where there could be major new discoveries made that we haven't been able for one reason or another yet to uh, explore. Thank you so much for uh, you know, on this discussion. And now I'll move to the second question that is uh, about uh, ships at that point of time, I mean, in the medieval times. What kind of ships were used for the maritime trade? Do you see any kind of archaeological evidences? Uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, so from, from the, you have mentioned about, all, all about the ship break as well that you have discovered. Uh, so what kind of evidences do you see? What kind of ships were used at that point of time? Well, the, the ships that we have found so far are usually only the bottom parts are preserved. You don't have the upper parts, so like the masts and so on. Uh, what usually happens with the shipwrecks in this area is that, you know, when they, the, the wooden structures sink to the riverbed or the, the, the bed of the ocean, um, they get eaten up by worms, teredo worms, and so on. The only parts that get preserved are those that actually are covered up by some kind of sea sediments. And so when that happens, it doesn't always happen. But when it does happen, when there's some kind of sediment in the water and the bottom parts of the, the hulls get buried, they will get preserved quite well. Uh, so there was actually one, the oldest known shipwreck from Southeast Asia was found up the Pahang River. And it was buried under some mud in the banks of the river. Apparently it was moored to the bank of the river and the river bank collapsed on, on it and buried it. And um, there's only fragments of the ship are left, but we can see this construction techniques. And it's using this kind of ship where they, they what's called the lashed lug technique. The, the various kinds of, uh, the, the planks of the ship bottom were tied together. And they used, uh, they didn't actually carve holes through the planks but they actually chipped off the kind of faces of the, the planking and they left a little raised portion and they would cut a hole through that and they would use this to lash the ship together. So it's kind of similar to the, Arabian, the Indian Ocean technique, which also uses lashings, but the lashings go right through the, the planks. The, the Malayo Polynesians don't go through the planks. They go through these, these lugs that are set up on the surface of the plank. And so that was what the, uh, the shipwreck from Pahang was like. The next oldest one we have, I think, is not till the 10th century. And it has the same kind of construction. There's one on the shore of north coast of Java, near Japara, a Rumbang area. And that one also was beached in the coastal uh, swamp. And that one is about 30 meters long. That's the best preserved one I think we have so far. So they were quite large. They were maybe 30 meters long. And we don't know what the rigging was like. None of that gets preserved, unfortunately. But you know, they're, they're 30 meters, quite sizable for their time. Um, and they were usually made out of several different types of wood. They would have various kinds of Southeast Asian wood, different kinds of wood for different functions. The, the, the hulls were made out of one type of wood. The masts were made up of another type. They would usually use the, um, you know, the coir, the kind of um, fiber from the sugar palm because that was very resistant to uh, seawater. So that's what they used to make their ropes out of on all their cables and the lashings. It would be made from the sugar palm. The same thing you get Gula Malacca from. The, the fibers of that tree are very good for lashing ships together. So that Arab Dao or the Arabo Persian Dao that was found down in Java, uh, the west part of the Java Sea, Belito, um, that one was made out of wood from Northeast uh, Africa. But then some parts of it, including the lashings, are made out of Southeast Asian fiber. So that ship obviously had been taken apart and put back together again, somewhere in the Straits of Malacca. So it must have been an old ship. Um, supposedly, according to the Arab sources, the ships would last between five and 20 years. 
and then they would need to be re-sewn. That's how long the lashings would last. And so this one had been completely refurbished in Southeast Asia. They had shipyards. In other words, repair yards in the ninth century where you could repair ships. We don't know anything about where these are. So but we do know something about Malay shipping technology of that period from these archeological sources. And they, they show connections with more recent China, uh, Malay uh, shipping construction right up until the 19th century. The Bugis still made similar types of ships until um, say the colonial period. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, coming again to the same questions, actually, you mentioned about the ship size, I mean, 30 meters, but do you think, I mean, that was the biggest size built at that point of time, or uh, generally ships were, some some of them maybe bigger than that, what was the size to you or see at that point of time? Now that's, that's the biggest we know of. Um, when we look at um, some of the old records, they mentioned several hundred people being on board a ship. I don't know how you could fit several hundred people on board a ship that's 90 meters long with all the cargo and so on, because the ships did not have decks. They were just open. Um, they, at the most, the captain might have had a little cabin uh, set up on some kind of a platform. But uh, the rest of the deck, uh, at the most, they would just have maybe some kind of mats on top of the cargo to protect it. So anyway, um, no, it's hard to, to, to there, there are some engineering technical problems which have to do with making a ship of this construction technique any bigger than about nine, 30 meters. So that might have been about the largest. Uh, the Portuguese say that some of the Javanese ships were bigger than anything the Portuguese had when they first arrived. So that might have been as much as 40 meters long. Uh, the, the Portuguese say, oh, we don't, you know, the ships were, the Javanese ships, they could shoot down into the Portuguese ships, meaning they were taller. So, yeah, they might have been up to 40 meters, but probably that would be a maximum. Uh, again, so coming to the same thing, same questions, actually, I mean, what kind of, what percentage of ships tend to be lost? I mean, you know, it's a, it's a uh, I don't know, what percentage of ships lost? I mean, you know, in terms of percentage and number, do you, do you have something kind of numbers with you? It seems like, um, that the, the percentage we have, uh, maybe about uh, a ship, uh, a man might expect to make five long distance voyages in his lifetime, any more than five, and he was really unusual to survive. So they, they, that was the kind of the life expectancy of the sailor. So the ship also, I think you know, between five and 20 years is about the, the life expectancy of a ship at that time. So you could either refit it, but it seems like they probably had areas um, where they would actually get rid of ships when they got old. They had like ship graveyards. There's one site in the South Philippines on the north side of Mindanao. There, there was a kingdom in the north uh, side of uh, Mindanao called Butuan, which had a lot of connections with China. And um, one site there has been found there about eight or nine ancient ships have been discovered all in the same location. It seems like it's not in the main shipway, shipping way. So when a ship did get old, it might be up five or to 20 years old, then they would get rid of it before it sank and right in the middle of the shipping lane. So they would move it off to the side and like um, uh, just abandon the ship, scuttle it maybe into one of the swamps nearby. So yeah, but I think 20 years would be like the maximum life expectancy. So, and so you could say the loss rate might've been 20%, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> and so it wasn't a very safe, safe lifestyle. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, actually, uh, then the, in, in the presentation, I have seen that, uh, you know, the shale ships coming from China to India because of the wind conditions, it operates certain months and from coming from India to China, it comes in certain time. So do you think that at that point of time, ships operate only once uh, toward the year, or do they take different voices at that point of time? It seems like they just operated, um, well, what they could do, they could go, say, from, they could go from the Straits of Malacca, from Singapore, for example, to China in one monsoon. And if they timed it right, then they'd have to, then there would be a kind of a lull in the winds, 
for maybe a month or so, and then the northeast monsoon would set in and they could sail back again. So that's probably mostly what they did, is that the ships could have made two voyages a year. Once, say, they could either go from Singapore to China or Singapore to India in one monsoon. And if they caught the tail end of the monsoon, they would get to India, then the, the monsoon would die. They wait around for a month or so, then that wind would set in from the opposite direction, they would sail back again. But the thing is, that's why the Straits of Malacca was so prosperous. You couldn't get from India to China in one season. But whereas, as a, so you could get from India to Singapore, you get from China to Singapore in one monsoon, but then you had to have to turn around again and go right home. And of course, that's what, what some merchants did, but then they would all be bidding against each other. So the prices would go way up at certain seasons of the year. And so eventually what they started doing is setting up trading bases in the Straits of Malacca. And they would set up enclaves. We know there were Indian, Chinese, um, uh, Arabic, Persian enclaves in Southeast Asia, at least by the 10th century. So they would actually stay here for over, so the, the ships would go back, but they would stay here in this region. And then they could wait around until the prices went down. So then they started setting up these kind of, uh, you know, Chinatowns and little Indias and so on. And that's, I think, what I was excavating in North Sumatra, because there was evidence of both Indians and Chinese and uh, also Arab Persians living on that site. So I think, so the ships would have one, system, one, one schedule and that they would probably either focus on the China Southeast Asia route or the Southeast Asia India route. But very few ships would have gone all the way from one end of the routes to the others because they have to, like you have to sail from South India to Singapore and then sit here for six months and do nothing before you could go on to China. So it would take you a year in most cases to get to China and then uh, have to wait there or go back. And then, so it would take you a year to get back again. So it'd be either a two year round trip or a six month round trip. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, then another next question is related to the shipbuilding traditions. And uh, the question is what shipbuilding traditions uh, were, uh, were dominated in early maritime trade? Was it Arab, Indian, Chinese, Southeast Asian? And you know, at that point of time. Yeah. Yes, the, well, that's funny because one of the oldest ships we have found is that Arabo Persian Dao, which was the one found in Belitong. Uh, but uh, that doesn't seem to have influenced Malay shipping very much. Um, there are probably more connections between India and Southeast Asia and ship building, but we don't have any ancient Indian ships yet. That's the problem, the, 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 the deposition and the kind of preservation. Um, the, the Indian, there is an Indian archeological department of underwater archeology, span which is based in Goa. And they've been looking for ancient Indian ships, and uh, but so far they haven't found any really ancient ones to compare. We know the tradition existed, but we don't have any actual remains of them so far. Uh, Chinese ships, uh, they didn't start building ocean-going ships until around 1300, say around 700 years ago. Before that, they didn't have ocean-going ships. They, they had just these flat bottom vessels, uh, very big, but uh, very, um, difficult to steer. They wouldn't, you couldn't really steer them very well. They didn't have any keels. Um, they could be very large, but they were mainly for coastal sailing and for going up the rivers, going along the Grand Canal and so on. Uh, but in the 14th century, a kind of hybrid type of ship began to be made, a Sino-Southeast Asian ship, which was using some Chinese techniques, um, like uh, having bulkheads. So the Chinese had bulkheads and the Southeast Asians didn't. So they started using bulkheads because they can have watertight compartments also. So the Southeast Asians started doing that and they started using nails. Uh, the Southeast Asians never used nails, but the Chinese did. And so then the Southeast Asians also started using nails around the 14th century. But they still, still kept on making more Southeast Asian V-shaped types of hulls and so on. So there was a hybrid shipping tradition which grew up after say about 1300. But uh, so there was an exchange there. But uh, Indian shipping, especially Bay of Bengal area is a major um, gap in our knowledge so far. We have 
depictions of Indian ships, but they're very schematic. They just show you a ship with a with a sail. You can't really see the the techniques. We know about the Indian navigational techniques because there's a a lot of discussion of them in ancient Indian texts. We know how they used navigational instruments. Um, there's a lot of textual material, but they don't describe the ships, <laughs> sadly enough. So I have a, I have a friend, uh, Sheila Tripathi, who is a, the head of the Indian uh, Archaeological Underwater Service in Goa. And he's, uh, they, they have a lot of colonial period ships, unfortunately. But finding the ancient ones is a major gap so far. So when we do begin to get them, and there hasn't been a whole lot of underwater archaeology in the Northwest Indian Ocean at all, or the Bay of Bengal for that matter. So one thing that's needed is a lot more concentration on the sea. Of course, the Indian Archaeological Service has been around for over 100 years, but its main traditions have always been looking at monuments, prehistoric sites on land. It's only, I think, 20 years ago they set up the maritime underwater archaeology sector. And so it's still a relatively new thing for India to look at Indian seafaring, strangely enough. So now there is a, a, a complete section devoted to it. So, is there uh, yeah. I think you were not audible, uh, Professor. I mean, okay, can you, you heard me, right? Shall I move, Shall I move to the second question, next question? Oh, yes, Shall please. I? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question is related to the port uh, on the Singapore River. So the question is, were all the ports were on the river or was it some ports uh, were on the remote coast away from the rivers as well? Ah, uh, so it seems like that they were, well, the, the major one was definitely along the Singapore River. And uh, there probably was another one up on the northeast side. And I think there was probably one also on Sentosa or around uh, Labrador Point somewhere. Because there are descriptions of early villages there. And um, the main determinant of where the port could be was water, fresh water. There can't be a port without seawater, without fresh water, sorry, drinking water. And that was one of the reasons why the Singapore River was actually very important is because there was a spring, there were two springs of water. One was on the side of Fort Canning Hill. And that's why the Chinese used the word Bansu to refer to 14th century Singapore, because that is just a Chinese transliteration of Malay word Panchur, spring of water. When the British arrived, there was still what they called the Forbidden Spring on the side of Fort Canning Hill on the River Valley Road side. And they said it was like duct on the side of Fort Canning Hill to channel all the water down to a big water tank. They built a tank on the side of the Singapore River, more or less where the uh, junction with Hill Street is now. And then boats out in the harbor would send their, their dinghies up the Singapore River with a barrel in it. And they would fill their water barrels out of the water in this tank without even having to go on land. So provision of water was always, just like now, a major important thing you had to have to have a port. You couldn't ship in your water. And uh, this was enough for all the water of Singapore until 1830. And then Singapore got overpopulated. And so they started digging wells all around the foot of Fort Canning. And that's when you know, Tank Road got its name. Tank Road on the backside of Fort Canning is because there was a water tank. And that's why it was there, because, uh, because there were a lot of wells, but it killed off the spring. And um, so that's always been the, one of the main determinants of where a port can be. And it's a limiting factor. A port can only grow as far as the availability of fresh water not only for the people living there, but also for the ships coming in. And so there were some places which had water, but no ports, like Tioman Island. Um, we have lots of evidence that there was a, ships were stopping off on Tioman Island, because if you sail across the South China Sea or come across the South China Sea, Tioman Island was a major landmark. You can see where you are. You can orient yourself by that. And also had enough water that ships would stock up on water, either going or coming. 
So that would be another place, but there was never a port there on T01. So you have to look and see where is the water. And that's the first, that will be the first thing. And usually population will grow. But those are the main things you look for. Where is the available potable water? So it probably would have been one at the mouth of the, the Badok River also. There was a village there, but now that's all, of course, underneath the East Coast Expressway, I'm afraid. So not likely we can find anything there. And um, some of the other rivers are really only estuaries, uh, like around some Bawang, um, Salitar, that area. The water up there is pretty brackish. It's not really a river, it's just, it's all tidal. And so the water is not really good anyway. So yeah, the, the locations of ports, you can pretty much narrow it down to where would the water have been. And there's only a few places. That's one reason why Singapore was important because there are very few springs right on the coastline anywhere in the Straits of Malacca, it's all mangroves. So you have to go like a hundred kilometers upstream, like in Sumatra, Palembang, it's a hundred kilometers from the mouth of the river. There are no big ports down between the Musi River mouth and Palembang. Only Palembang is our fresh water. So the port was there, even though it's way upstream. Uh, same with the other ports in the region, They're either way upstreams uh, or very few places where there's fresh water available right down on the coastline, then you would have a port there. So that's Uh, now I'll move to the final question that is uh, whole archaeological excavation is something related to knowing our route and connecting to connecting to it better and stronger. Since you are in the field for almost three decades, how does it help you and your student and you as a person while digging deeper to the route? How does it you know, Sorry, what affect change question, you? Bro? I mean, uh, the question is the whole archaeological excavation process itself is knowing our route or connecting to it better. That's the, so how does it, does it change you and your student as a person while, while for the whole exercise for almost three decades? Ah, I think you know, one of the main reasons I became interested in this topic was that when I first came to Southeast Asia, Everybody thought that Southeast Asia was a really backward part of the world. Why was I going there? Um, what would possibly be interesting here? But it was so obvious from the historical records that Southeast Asia wasn't just an uh, isolated and uh, backwater place that, that had been at the junction of lots of trade routes. But mostly people focused on the Indian and the Chinese sources. They didn't read the Malay sources. So one of the things I did was to learn to read Malay and to uh, to read Arabic script also, so that I could read some of the old texts. And um, then my, I got fortunate, I was, I was fortunate to find a teacher at Cornell University who had been working on Malay sources and he also knew Chinese. And then I had another friend who was a Sanskrit teacher there who would help me with the Indian sources. So I don't know Chinese or, or any Indian languages or Sanskrit, I still Malay. But um, it seemed to me that first of all, it should have been at least interesting in terms of the, the kind of junction of Indian and Chinese and kind of Polynesian culture. There should have been interesting cultural hybridity in this area. And it, you know, then I found out there was such a thing as Pranakan culture, and it had been probably in existence for at least 500 years. And it was just, the whole thing was very romantic, looking at the long distance communication that the Europeans were quite unaware of. Marco Polo was the first one to kind of mention it because of course he sailed back. He, he walked all the way to China, but then he got a ride back on a Chinese fleet as far as Persia. So he found out that there was a navigational route. They re rediscovered one that Europe had known before, but uh, they, did, they had forgotten about. And so he was the first European maybe in seven or 800 years to pass through Southeast Asia. And he, he mentions uh, all the spices coming through the region and so this is just a completely neglected part of world history. And I thought uh, it was also equally worthy of uh, having a focus on, uh, besides the great empires looking at, uh, you know, the Taj Mahal or the Great Wall of China, things connected with, uh, with mainland empires, 
Now, there was only one. Well, my family's traditions way back go. There were some sea captains in my family, but I think the last one was in the 19th century. And uh, it was in the U.S. Civil War. I think that was the last time we actually had a sea captain in the family. Then we became basically landlubbers for <laughs> 200 years after that. I was kind of interested to go back. One of my relatives or, or my cousin. It's a kind of con, uh, con, confluence of different things. And so my students, and I just like to, when we're defining artifacts, maybe just we'd like to talk about, you know, how did this get here? What person was the last one to touch this item? Where did they come from? Because Singapore had a multicultural, multi-ethnic population 700 years ago. Each object had its own story to tell. Could it come from local? Could it come from Rio Archipelago? Could it come from across the Indian or the ocean or South China Sea? So we'd like to just imagine things. It's, it really calls on you to exercise your free, your imagination, your freedom of thought, to think of just what are all the possibilities different from what's going on now, or maybe the same because people are now interested in hybridity again and connectivity. One of ASEAN, you know, ASEAN's five-year plans for now is looking at connectivity and looking how is ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, um, come to exist. Becoming interested in these connections rather than their own narrow nationalistic kinds of concerns. So I'm hoping that I can somehow contribute to this also. I think it's much better for the world as a whole if we start looking at ports and connections and exchanges rather than looking inward. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor John, uh, for, for the great discussion. I thoroughly enjoyed this discussion, discussion and hope. Uh, it helped me to dig deeper, understand the root better. And I believe same would be in the mind of the guests, guests as well. Uh, but this, we have came to an end of the Q&A session, and uh, here I'm going to share my screen once again. So you can see the feedback form here, and uh, I would request you all to uh, use this feedback form either from using the link tiny URL code or the scan QR code and give us feedback that how we did and where we can improve. Now I'd like to thank once again, Professor John for the great discussion. And uh, as a token of appreciation, we will be sending a plug to your home or office address as per your preference. And for that, our team will contact you separately. Also, I'd like to take this moment to thank our parent organizations, Dina and Armadist for supporting, for support in executing this webinar. I'd like to thank to the council member of uh, Singapore Joint Branch, our partner organizations, NIMS and SSA. I'd like to thank uh, uh, our STV uh, team, especially Shea McKinney, for her team and her team for working behind the scene and making this event flawless and fluent. Last but not the least, our members, guests around the globe for their support and presence and hope we have find it useful and worthy of your time. And uh, before I say goodbye, I'd like to invite uh, facilitator Shea McKinney for a quick announcement. Shea, please. Thank you, Vimal. Um, thank you, everybody, for watching at home. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen now so that you can see how you can join the post event networking session. Um, so, this is uh, private but unmonitored. So, please note that participation is optional and at your own risk. Not that it's risky. Uh, you can head to www.imarrest.org forward slash meet now and then use the password webinar to gain access. It's very easy to use. Uh, you can just move your little icon around to click on other people to start a video chat um, or join a group who's already talking. Um, so,